book of John chapter number 12 as our children are dismissed with Jason. These front monitors are dead up here if I could get them turned back on. Uh, you know I'll strip all my gears out tonight without them. <clears throat> Who's ready to have camp meeting tonight? And I tell you, last night the Lord began talking to me, and I, I was talking to, to Brother Eddie on my way to church tonight. And uh, I said, I feel like the Lord has talked to my heart. And uh, I said, I knew that several were going to be out. I said, I don't know how many is going to be there. I said, but forever how many there are, they're going to get both barrels tonight. <laughs> uh, and so I... Um, I'm excited to share what the Lord has laid upon my heart. And uh, thank God for His Word. You know, we are living in perilous times. But we're not living in these perilous times alone. We have the Word of God that we can stand upon. And uh, I am thankful for the Word of God. If you uh, listen to the words of mainstream media, uh, you will go absolutely crazy. Because they are absolutely crazy. <laughs> you listen to the words of, uh, you know, Fauci or the CDC or whomever. I mean, you're thinking, dear God, is there any hope? But I promise you, you listen to the words of this book, yes, and you'll find life, yes. and uh, you'll find hope. Paul said, if we had hope in this life, only would be of all men most miserable. There's a lot of miserable people in this world today because all the only hope that they have is in this world. Amen. But I'm thankful that my hope was birthed and born from above. And, uh, uh, you know, I can still have victory in my soul despite all the chaos that's going around, on, around us in this world. And there is victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I am convinced of that more now than ever. Amen. And I thank God for the victory that I feel, the liberty that I have in my soul. Amen. Of knowing Him. John 20, or 12, we're going to begin our reading with verse number 27. This is Jesus speaking. And He said, Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. And Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. I want to preach tonight if the Lord will help us on this thought. Our darkest moment or our finest hour. Our darkest moment or our finest hour. Brother, I'm still dead in the monitors if you could turn us up. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you tonight. We are so thankful for the privilege that we have once again to come into your house to worship you in spirit and in truth, in the beauty of your holiness. Thank you, O oh God, for your spirit that we have been made to feel. I'm asking, O oh God, that your glory would come down. Father, the anointing of God is what I seek in this house tonight. Father, I have nothing. I can do nothing without you. But I must have your hand. I must have your touch. Father, I pray that your spirit, God, your life would issue and flow out of me. God, the same way that I feel you gave it unto me last night. God, that you would deal with our hearts, that you would deal with this church to show us, oh God, our unlimited potential in this present hour. Oh God, I pray that we could see tonight, God, past the, the pain, past the chaos, past the confusion. Father, that our eyes could see and behold our greater purpose in you, that you would do a work in our hearts and in our lives, and we'll be careful to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise for all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray it. And the church says amen. And amen. Is this our darkest moment? Or is this our finest hour? In our text, we 
know that Christ is speaking here. And we see this in one of His most vulnerable moments of humanity. We know in the study of Christology that while Jesus Christ was 100% man, that was full of 100% humanity, He was 100% God, full of divinity. And as He is Christ, I believe that in these portions of Scripture, the first part, we see the man Christ Jesus speaking. We see the, the human nature of Christ as He looks ahead at what is unfolding and He says, My soul is troubled. To be able to understand the context of our text uh, in just uh, a, a few verses before, we read of the triumphant entry into Jerusalem where He's riding upon the, the, the foal of an ass and He is riding through the streets to a multitude and a throng of people crying, Hosanna! Hosanna! Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. They're strolling in front of Him palm branches. They're taking off their cloak, their outer garment as a sign of reverence and obedience unto Christ. They're uh, the, the, the ones that they were crying out, the, the Messiah. He is the one that's going to save us. Now, most of them were thinking that He was going to save them from Roman opposition. That He was going to set up an earthly throne. And that's what Hosanna means is, uh, oh, save us. They were expecting Him to be the one to deliver uh, them from Roman captivity. But here Christ is as He's coming through Jerusalem into this uh, applause to this roar, to the buzz that's in the air as they're looking unto Him as the one to save them. They're looking for Him to, to be the Messiah that rescues them from uh, Roman occupation. But as He is here, the, as the, the buzz begins to die down, as the crowds begin to disperse, we come to this point in time in, in uh, John chapter number 12 where He is alone here. And He is talking with His disciples. They have, uh, the, the Greeks have come to Him saying, Sir, we desire to see Jesus. They come to Andrew and to Philip. And Jesus answered and said, The, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He goes on to give uh, those famous verses of Scripture. But then we see the man Christ Jesus speaking when He says, My soul is troubled. You see, Jesus was looking ahead in time. And He knew what was going to transpire a week later. He knew the pain the agony, the reproach. He knew the, the shame. He knew that Calvary was just in sight. He knew that He was going to be beaten. He was going to be spat on. We have crucified and ultimately He would die. And He, the, the man Christ Jesus, now my soul is troubled. Father, save me from this hour. Down in the core of His soul, Jesus was troubled. One could look at him and say the next hours of his life would be the darkest hours that the man Christ Jesus would face. From this point all the way to the cross, the darkest hours that he would ever have to endure. But in the same breath as him knowing the agony that lies ahead, knowing the, the, the cross of Calvary that was just inside, in the same breath that he said, my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. In the same breath, we see another statement. He says, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. The humanity of Christ was shaken and troubled. His soul was troubled. But the divinity of Christ realized that His purpose was about to be fulfilled. Right. That everything in, uh, throughout all of eternity, you see, Christ not only lived for 33 and a half years in human form, but before Abraham was, Jesus said, I am. 
Amen. He is not a create, created being as eternally existent as the Father is. Christ is also eternally existent. And the Bible says uh, that for this cause, uh, amen, before the foundation of the world was the, the, uh, the, the Son of God was crucified, the Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world, uh, before God ever spoke the world into existence, uh, before the Son was ever created, before Adam and Eve already fell, Christ knew that He was going to be the sacrificial Lamb that would give His life uh, so that man may be uh, made at one with Christ. Uh, amen. And so from the even the foundations of the world, uh, Christ knew uh, the divinity of uh, Christ knew that everything that has transpired up to this point uh, was leading Him to this hour. Uh, amen. My soul is troubled in this hour, in this minute. Uh, but at this same time, uh, for this cause came I uh, unto this hour. He realized uh, His whole purpose was uh, for coming. This was going to be his darkest moment but this was also going to be his finest hour this was going to be his darkest time but this was also going to be his finest time for he said in John 12 verse 32 if I be lifted up from the earth will draw all men unto me and then in these statements we see the rejection the pain the sorrow the humiliation the abandonment the difficulty the agony the torture and the death that Christ knew lied ahead but as it relates to his divinity he said for this hour have I come this is why I am here for this purpose the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil Christ knew his purpose for coming and the glory that would be made manifest through this at the end of his life there was a battle raging in the humanity of Christ Christ had to overcome a battle equally as challenging as Calvary he had to endure that flesh one more time we see that same battle in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Oh, as we see this battle that was raging inside of Christ, if he is our blueprint and our mold, this shows us the battle that the church must overcome in her final hour. In the final hours of Christ, amen, we see the, the, the anguish, the agony, amen, the trouble that was down in his soul, but we also see his purpose for coming that he may be lifted up and to draw all men unto him. Oh, for the outward man, as we live in this present hour, folks, it is a dark, dark world. I'm not here to preach to you a lot of current events. You know what's going on in the world just as well as I do. I don't have to tell you, amen, all of the thing, I preach about COVID or death or peril or destruction. I don't have to tell you how our sworn enemies have taken over 20 years of our work and what we've invested billions or trillions of dollars in has burned up overnight. And the same people that flew the, flew the planes, amen, in the Pentagon and set in the World Trade Center in September 11th. And now as we have left Afghanistan and they have acquired our planes, now have the 35th largest air force in the world. Think about that. Perilous times. And you say they can't do anything with it. You saw what they did with it on September the 11th. What do you think could be looming just around the corner? We are living in dangerous and dark and perilous times. We see propaganda meant to divide and conquer us on many fronts. We see civil liberties being eroded and socialism on the brink. I mean, as we look in the world, there is not a lot of good that we can preach about. There's not a lot of hope. There's not a lot of help. That when we look on the horizon, that we can hang our hat on. And we can uh, put our hope and our heart in. Uh, amen. But as we look at this dark hour, uh, we must realize this hour uh, is a fulfillment of Scripture. Yes. 
Everything that is transpiring right before our eyes uh, was written down uh, 2,000 years ago and spoken. Uh, amen. As the men of old uh, were inspired by the Holy Ghost. Uh, amen. As we look at the Holy Scripture uh, and the disciples asking Christ on the Mount of Olives, uh, asking Him what uh, is going to be the sign of thy coming in Matthew chapter number 24. Dear God, uh, it's just like the 6 o'clock news. Uh, everything that Christ said would happen uh, is transpiring and right before our very eyes. Amen. When we look at the, the world, it's dark. I don't have to preach to you about the rumors of wars. I don't have to preach to you about the perilous times and the pestilences that's coming. I don't have to preach to you about earthquakes in diverse places. I don't have to preach to you about those being afflicted and dying. Amen. For His name's sake, you just watch a three-minute clip on the six o'clock news and you can check it off the list one by one. And then Fox News, CNN, CBS, they're all preaching their propaganda. Amen. And it's telling the world one thing. We're headed for perilous times. And we're in perilous times. Oh, but for the church. Oh, hallelujah. To the world, it means one thing. But to the church, it means something else. To the world, it may shake them to the core. But to the church, hope springs up in my heart. Oh, a pep comes into my step. And joy floods my soul. Because yes, we are living in some darkest moments. But for the church, if we'll just hold on, this will be our finest hour. This will be our defining moment. He that shall endure until the end, the same shall be saved. Paul preached about this hour. Know that perilous times shall come. That word perilous means dangerous. Know that in the last days, dangerous times are going to be unfolding all around the world. It is a dangerous hour. I had to go to CVS to pick up some uh, things on the, the way to uh, church tonight there were probably 50 people in there and I, I'm not here preaching on mask or against mask but I wish you could have seen the looks as I'm walking through that store not wearing one I had never experienced that before even with the first wave I, I, uh, they looking at me like I've absolutely lost my mind going somewhere without a mask it's dangerous all around. You got some people that don't even want to leave their basement. You got some people that have masks on in the car with their windows up and they're by themselves because they're scared of the danger that's lurking. Hey, dear God, you can't even walk the streets of Chicago without being a statistic of those that are mugged or beaten. You take your life into your own hands when you walk in the inner cities of our cities across America. In Afghanistan, they're killing them by the droves tonight for the simple reason that they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the captain of their, our salvation. Folks, it's dangerous times. It's perilous times that we're living in. All Scripture is literally being fulfilled right before our eyes. And the world is screaming to us. Amen. That yes, Yes, it's dark times. Yes, it's dangerous times. Yes, it's perilous times. But don't lose hope. Amen. And don't lose faith. This is about to be the church's finest hour. Oh, hallelujah. The same way Christ was manifested. The whole purpose for His being was what transpired in those final three days. Amen. And that became His finest hour. For us, we were birthed and we were placed here for a time such as this in this hour yes it's dark but this hour God needed some men and women to be born again and filled with the Holy Ghost to be a part of the glorious church that could turn the world upside down and be raptured out in victory folks we are part of that body we are part of the church this is not amen the end this is our finest hour we will not. You hear this preacher tonight. We will not be defeated. Oh, hallelujah. 
The church is not going down. She's about to go up. Hallelujah. The ship of Zion, it's not sinking tonight. But soon and very soon, she's about to drop anchor in the harbor of heaven. Oh, hallelujah. Where we're walking gravel streets, our asphalt streets tonight in the flesh. Oh, our faith is going to end in sight. And we're going to wind up on streets of gold. Oh, my God. No longer in urban cities that's full of crime, full of death, full of chaos, full of confusion. Oh, we're going to be in a place forever where there's peace and joy that shall know no end. Hallelujah, where there's uh, no more sickness uh, and no more death uh, and there's no more pain uh, and no more tears. Oh my God, I feel the Holy Ghost uh, in the house tonight. Uh, amen. Yes, it's dark. Uh, amen. Yes, this may be the darkest hour that the world uh, has ever had to endure. Uh, but for the church, uh, don't lose heart. Uh, for the church, don't lose hope. Uh, I believe with all of my heart tonight, uh, this is going to be uh, our finest hour. I believe that this is an hour where in the church world the wheat is about to be separated from the chaff. I believe it, folk. You've got your mega churches that's been built on false hope and fool's gold. It's about time that the church is going to put up or shut up. It's about time to reveal whether you got the goods or whether you don't. Whether you're full of glory or whether you've been propped up on games. I believe it with all of my heart the ministries built on hype and hidden agendas are about to be shut down while the true church is about to arise with a message, let God be true and let every man be a liar. I believe with all of my heart this is going to be our finest hour because this is the hour where God says in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. We know that that scripture began its fulfillment in the upper room on the day of Pentecost where the wind began to blow, where the fire fell. And they were all baptized with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. And I believe ever since that day the church has been on a marathon. Amen. Taking this journey one step at a time. It's not been a sprint, but it has been an endurance race. Amen. I was watching in the Olympics. There's a marathon runner from Kenya by the name of, I can't remember his first name and I'm going to butcher his second name. But I believe his last name was Kachogi. That man may have weighed 105 pounds soaking wet. Now listen, I, running a marathon does not appeal to me. I, I never picture myself running a marathon. And none of you can picture me running a marathon. I've never desired to watch a marathon in my life. Ever. I can find something better to do with my time than to watch somebody run a race. But the Olympics, I guess it was two Saturdays ago, they had the marathon. And I don't know why, Brother Daniel. I've never had a desire to watch a race before. I had some other stuff that was going on in the house. But for about two hours, I was glued watching those rascals run. That run a distance. They had everything strategic. They had it down to the, uh, they had different stations where they would grab the water and ice and they would pack ice down their shirt or put it in their cap and they would run. They had certain stations to where they would get water to stay hydrated. And then they had other stations to where they had their own mixture of drinks with certain electrolytes in, in some stations. So they would. Uh, staged that out in the race and at different intervals they had this thing all planned out. They had it down to such a science form that they had different drinks with different electrolytes at different portions of the race. That blew my mind. That's how scientific 
and how much of a form they got this thing down to. And Kachoki was running his race and he stayed about the front of the pack. And there was this tall man, an American, I don't know, probably 6'3", six, 6'4", six, running right behind him for about the, the marathon is 26.2 miles. For about the first 18 miles of that race, Kachoki would, would, would run, that American would be right behind him. And the commentators were saying the American's plan is to stay right on the heels of Kachoki. I hope I'm saying that name right. Amen. But that was his plan. Kachoki would take water, the American man would get water. Kachoki would get a pack of ice and put it on his back, the American would get ice. Every step that Kachoki took, the American man mimicked. Well, at around mile 18 or 20, Kachoki got tired of it. He turned around and looked at the American and made some gestures. I don't know what the gestures were. Amen. I didn't look at it that much. But he turned around and he, he began to speak to it. And you could see the American began to wilt as, as Kachoki spoke. He began to back off. And the American never was the same again. He finished somewhere around 10th or 12th. But it was at that time, Kachoki, after he made his gestures and after he said something to him, he motioned at him. He said, just come on, kind of taunt him a little bit. And that skinny African from Kenya, he caught a second wind at around mile 18 or 20. And it was then that while everybody else was catching cramps and falling out of the pack, Kachoki took off like a bolt of lightning. And within the next two miles, uh, he had already built up a minute and a half lead. You can tell how into the race I was. Uh, amen. Knowing all of these statistics. Uh, amen. A mile or uh, two miles later, he was a minute uh, and a half ahead. Uh, amen. By the time that man finished the race, uh, amen, he sat there. Uh, uh, he, he finished the cheering line. He grabbed the Kenyan flag and celebrated the goal. Uh, he wasn't even breathing hard. Other men, as he waited on them at the finish line, uh, he literally folded his arms and waited on him uh, to cross the line. He met them uh, as they crossed. Uh, they're passing out. Uh, they're cramping up. Uh, they're falling out on the ground, catching, uh, uh, trying to catch their breath. Uh, Kachoki sitting there carrying on a conversation with them. Uh, he wasn't even breathing hard. Uh, I mean, there was something that happened in that marathon race. Uh, he had conditioned himself uh, to know uh, when to turn on the jets. Uh, he had conditioned Conditioned himself to know uh, when he was going to catch his second wind. Uh, and when he called his second wind, uh, he left everybody else in the pack. Uh, listen, uh, our first wind came on the day of Pentecost uh, when there came a sound from heaven uh, as of a rushing mighty wind. Uh, and it filled all the house uh, where they were sitting. Uh, it's time for the church uh, to catch her second wind uh, and to finish this thing. Uh, and then not limping across the finish line uh, and then not falling out uh, and not finishing uh, but it's time that we finish this thing in glory uh, that we be like that little Kenyan uh, that catches our second wind uh, and we leave the devil in the dust uh, and then we leave our enemies and our adversaries in the dust uh, and we go on uh, and we finish this race well oh my God uh, he baptized us in power uh, he baptized us in his Holy Ghost uh, he has given us everything that we need uh, to be victorious uh, it's up to us uh, to walk in victory uh, and to hear him say, well done. Amen. I believe with all of my heart in this hour. Oh, hallelujah. We're getting ready to catch our second wind, Brother Mix. We're getting ready to catch our second wind. In the last days, he's going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And I believe, if I didn't believe this, I'd put the microphone down and I'd walk out those doors and I'd never grace the pulpit again. If I didn't believe this with all my heart, I wouldn't be a charlatan the claims that I do. It secretly believes that I don't. I believe, amen, for the true church of the living God, what they had and what they saw in the upper room, we can have it and we can see it again. They turn their world upside down for the gospel's sake. Without printed press. Without a microphone. Without a jet airplane. They didn't even have Facebook or Twitter. None of that. But yet in just a short time, all of Asia had heard the gospel. 
Amen. I believe with all of my heart the true church of the living God. They've laughed at us. They've mocked us. They've done everything that they could to try to silence us. To do everything they could to make us shut up. And to sit down and to know our place. Oh, but I believe with all of my heart the church of the living God. Amen. Is about to stand up victorious in this hour. And yes, we are living in the beginning of sorrows. Yes, we are living in the last of the last days. And beloved, they are dark. But I'm not here cursing the darkness tonight. I am here propagating the light. Amen. I am here preaching the light of this glorious gospel. Amen. And the Word of God tells us, amen, that we are called to be, amen, a city on a hill which cannot be hid. It's time for the church to do her job, to rise up. Amen. There's not a government entity around uh, that can shut us up or silence us. Uh, amen. We may be told uh, to muzzle ourselves, uh, but I believe we'll be just like the prophet Jeremiah. Have a fire shut up on the inside of the bar our bones. Uh, amen. And that fire of the world uh, didn't give it unto us. Uh, and the world can't take it away. Uh, it's time that we catch uh, our second win. Yes. But I believe this is the finest hour because this is the hour that I believe is going to usher in the second coming of Christ. This is the hour that will issue in, issue in the rapture of the church and the church going home. Amen. Some of you may be like Jesus. Amen. To where a week out from Calvary, my soul is troubled. You're troubled when you watch the news. You're troubled when you see the plight of your country. You're troubled when you see the incompetence in our government. You're troubled when you see America being humiliated on a world stage. You're troubled when 4 million people around the world, I believe is the latest statistic, that have succumbed to COVID. You're troubled, amen, by everything that you see and by everything that you hear. You're troubled by the darkness that's engrossed in the world. Amen. But the Bible tells us that darkness has covered the earth. And gross darkness is people. Amen. You're troubled by what you see. Amen. There's, there's people that are throwing in the towel and quitting. The Bible says that in the last days men's hearts would fail them for fear when they see what's coming upon the face of the earth. Amen. That means men. Amen. Are going to be fearful. Men are going to trouble men. Amen. Their heart, their spirit is going to fail them because of the, the chaos and the confusion and the darkness that they feel. The fear that surrounds them. Amen. It quenches the light of victory that they have in their soul. We are there. People, my mind has been blown of things in the church. People, the sowing in the towel and quitting uh, that you never would have expected uh, that you would never think about uh, this done uh, this waving the white flag of surrender uh, and then they're no longer living holy uh, they're no longer living right uh, they even no longer claim to be Christians what's happening uh, the word of God is being fulfilled right uh, before our very eyes uh, we are living in dark times uh, and yes uh, this may be some dark moments uh, oh but if we'll hold on church uh, this will be uh, our finest hour Hour. I've got to hurry. I'm sorry, Taylor. I can't preach this in 14 minutes. Moses in Egypt. Can you imagine what it's like in Exodus chapter number 11 when God is talking to him and delivers his plan? And he said, Pharaoh's crossed the line. He's hardened his heart in this side of of Egypt for the last time. I'm going to send a plague. I'm going to wipe out all of the firstborn of Egypt. Every cow, every horse, every billy goat, the firstborn of everything is going to die. Can you imagine the darkness that night in Egypt? Can you imagine what it was like to hear the wails and the cries, the moans of a mama that's holding a dead baby in Egypt. Can you imagine what it's like for a son or for a father to be holding the lifeless corpse of his son? Can you imagine how dark that moment was in Egypt? 
the darkest, quite possibly in human history up to that time. But for Egypt, it meant one thing. But to the children of Israel, it meant something totally different. <laughs> because God talked to them and said, that's how I'm going to deal with the world. That's how I'm going to deal with Pharaoh. Amen. That's how I'm going to deal with those that have hardened their heart against me. But Moses, he said, I want you to take a lamb. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. I want you to take that lamb. And he said, I, I, I want you to take the blood of that lamb. I want you to slay it. And you take the blood and you put it on the doorpost of your house. And when I see the blood, Moses, I'm going to pass over you. Amen. Amen. You're not going to experience what Pharaoh's experiencing because my blood is going to be applied to your house. My blood is going to be applied to your family. So you, you follow every detail down to the most minute one. You take that lamb. You kill it. Put his blood over your home. Then I want you and your family to eat the lamb. And if the lamb be too much for you, then join forces with your neighbors. And y'all both partake of the lamb. But don't leave anything of it. You partake of everything of that animal. Amen. When you partake of that lamb, what is that a type of? Amen. That is a type of Christ. When you are partaking of Christ, you will find safety in the middle of a world of darkness. Oh, there's power in His blood. Amen. There's power in His person. Amen. If you'll partake of Him, you'll never go hungry. He'll give you strength. He'll give you power. He'll give you might despite all of the difficulties of the world around you. But then He said, Moses, last thing. He said, you tell them. You tell my people to put their shoes on. Hallelujah. To get the staff in their hand. To get ready. Because we're getting out of here. Amen. I'm about to call them home uh, into the land flowing of milk and honey that I uh, have prepared for them. Uh, for Moses, it was a dark, dark night in Egypt. Uh, amen. To them, it went, meant one thing. Uh, but to God's chosen people, uh, it meant deliverance. Uh, to Egypt, uh, it meant destruction. Uh, to Egypt, uh, it meant doom. Uh, amen. But for God's people, it meant deliverance. Uh, it meant that they had been delivered uh, from the bonds of Egypt. Uh, oh, and they were free to walk in Christ. Uh, listen these dark moments. Uh, it means one thing to the world, uh, but it means something altogether different uh, for the child of Almighty God. Uh, it's time uh, that we get our shoes on. Uh, amen. We guard about our loins. Uh, we get our staffs and our hands. Uh, my God, uh, we're about to get out of here uh, and we're going home. For Daniel, when Belshazzar saw the handwriting on the wall, and none of his counterparts could interpret the dream. He said, you bring me that Daniel. Bring me that man of God that you say is wise and can understand dreams. Daniel looked at that dream. He interpreted many, many people you force him. Told him what it meant. Amen. That night, he's been weighed in the balance. He's been found wanting. And his kingdom is going to be plucked out of his hand. And it's going to be given to another. It was a dark, dark night in Babylon. It was a dark, dark night for Belshazzar. It was the darkest of nights. But for old Brother Daniel, hallelujah, for the man of God, I believe when he left interpreting that dream, there was a pep in his step that he hadn't had in quite a while. I and mean, then I believe his heart leapt within him. And his spirit was revived and renewed. Uh, and they may have asked him, Daniel, what's going on? Uh, amen. How can you be victorious? Uh, amen. When such destruction is coming. Uh, how can you sing a song of victory? Uh, when this kingdom is about to be rent from the king's hands uh, and given to another. Uh, amen. I believe that the old man of God said, uh, we've been waiting 70 years uh, for this time to come. Uh, amen. To Belshazzar. Uh, amen. Uh, it means one thing. Uh, but to us, uh, it means we're going back home. Uh, amen. And God is about to deliver us and take us back to the land of promise. I'm telling you, church, hold on just a little bit longer. Yes, it's dark. I mean, yes, it's bleak. Yes, there's no hope to be found in this world. But I've got victory in my soul. I've got some step in my step because I know this is our finest hour and we are about to go home. If you can't shout over that, 
Your shouter needs repairing. Brother Daniel, we're about to go home. Hallelujah. Yes, Sister Sherry, we're about to go home. And Brother Meeks, the heaven we've been working toward for all these years, it's just in sight. Now's not the time to quit. Yes, it's dark. Yes, this is some of the darkest hours that the world has ever known. But for the church, amen, this is our finest hour. Amen, we, amen, are on the brink of the rapture of the church when he splits those eastern skies and the dead in Christ rise up. And then when we, we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together to meet him in the clouds. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. We are about to experience that great getting up morning and we are going home. Curse said, come help me, I'm done. I feel camp meeting in my heart. What we've been waiting on for years is about to be a reality. Oh, Paul wrote to Timothy. He says, son, endure hardness as a good soldier. If you can endure the hardness, then son, you can experience the glory. Oh, hallelujah. If you can endure the hardness down here, folks, we're going to experience the glory up there. Apollo 13. You all know that story very well. Space shuttle takes off going on its Mission to the moon. Think on day two of the mission. It's an explosion. Oxygen canisters explode. They have less than 48 hours to live according to their best calculations. They issue the famous words, Houston, we have a problem. Over the next 48 hours, there's a frantic, frantic pace around the space station, the space center in Houston to try to bring those boys home. In the midst of all of this, they're trying to devise a plan. Two of the younger workers in the space station were talking back and forth. They didn't know it, but the director of the space center was right over their shoulder. And one of the young guns said to the other, looking at his calculations, he said, brother, how does it feel to be working at NASA and what's going to be our darkest hour? The other man just hung his head. But the director of NASA stepped up, straightened his tie, looking both dead in the eyes. He said, boys, this is not going to be our darkest hour moment. This is going to be our finest hour. This is going to be our finest hour. It was then that the tide began to turn and those boys, three astronauts, came home safely. And not just American heroes, but our heroes around the world. Thank God for a wise man to look past the difficulties, to look past the problems, to look past the chaos and the confusion. <laughs> Said this, yes, it may be dark, but what a great opportunity for us to shine. What a great opportunity, amen, for this to be our finest hour. For the church, I, Brother Daniel, say the same exact thing. It's dark, absolutely. It's chaotic, absolutely. It's perilous, absolutely. We beginning of sorrows, you better believe it. The great falling away, we're experiencing it right before our very eyes. All of these things. But the question is tonight, where does your perception lie? Does your perception lie in the darkness? Or does your perception lie with the light? Hallelujah. Are you only focusing on the darkness? Are you focusing on the light of lights? Hallelujah. The glorious soon coming King. The Alpha and the Omega that's never lost a battle and never will lose a battle. That's the all-time undefeated, 
undisputed champion, hallelujah, of the world. The one that's never known defeat and never will know defeat. But at the end of this thing, he's coming back on a white horse. Amen. Coming back to judge the nations. And while the devil is in a bottomless pit and the lake of fire forever and forever and forever, he's going to be ruling and reigning forever, forever and forever. And for the born again and the redeemed, those that are looking for him the second time when he appears without sin unto salvation, forever and forever. We're going to be at His feet worshiping Him. Joining in with the angels saying holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with His glory and as a matter of fact for the span of about 45 minutes in heaven, they're going to have to shut up. Amen. And we're going to sing a song of redemption that they can't. Oh my God. Hallelujah. Amen. It's about to be a reality, folks. We are about to experience our finest hour. Stand with us all over the building undone tonight. Amen. I want you to meet me on these altars tonight. Amen. I want you to meet me. Some of you might need to change your perception. Some of you might need to change your vision. Some of you might need to change what voice you're listening to. Amen. And what your eyes are beholding. Get your eyes back on Jesus. Get your ears back in tune with His voice and His Word. Amen. We're not going down in defeat, but we are going up with a shout. Join us in these altars tonight. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.